Good morning. We're just here doing a uh, quick sound and video check for um, the Monday lecture of week week ten. Um, just checking that the title page is being displayed. Wonderful. Thank you. And. Just check the audio. Wonderful. Okay, I'll make it just on nine o'clock. I'll be offline for a few minutes and we'll start the lecture at 9.05. See you then.
<laughs> okay, we're back online. Um, lectures about to get underway. I'll just do just let someone let me know that the video's all good and the audio's all good in the questions lectures channel. Checking that. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Let's get underway. Okay. Um, Monday, week 10. We have got some lecture content to cover today, and I've picked two topics here, and we'll work through those with you over the course of the lecture. Before we get underway, I want to talk a little bit about the assignment, programming assignment number two. Um, it was released on Blackboard just a few minutes ago, and it's due on the Monday of week 13. So it's you'll have um, three weeks to get that assignment done. That assignment is uh, covers the topic of image processing. Um, in, in some detail. And we've carefully structured this week's lab around getting you started with the assignment. So my very strong advice to you is to uh, use this week's lab, the week 10 lab, not assessed, it's just a, um, a standard lab, is to use that as an activity to springboard you into doing the assignment. Um, there's some overlap between the first questions in the assignment and, um, and the lab. So if you work through the lab sheet, and my understanding is that Sarah's busily typing up, the getting the lab sheet into a form that can be uploaded to Blackboard um, very shortly. It'll be there this morning. It'll be there in time for the first, for the first labs that run this week. Um, and so the idea of that worksheet is to take little baby steps in loading and processing image files that allow you to get a, a sense of the data structures and the data types that are used in order to complete the assignment. So a few words of advice. Um, the assignment sheet uh, is, is relatively lengthy. One of the reasons for that is that there's some really important um, information in the preamble, in the introductory text in the assignment. So um, the, the assignment itself works through a number of steps, converting image formats from one format to another. Um, but the background information you need on, on image processing is all contained in the lab sheet. So it's quite an interesting um, and detailed topic you're not expected to have any understanding or background in that in that field. So the lab sheet has for this week, or the, the assignment sheet rather, has been deliberately structured around giving you the information that you need to get yourself started from um, a zero base in order to um, to do the, the the processing that's needed. Another, the second reason that the lab sheet is relatively lengthy is because it's quite detailed in asking for you uh, what's what's required of you. Um, the idea of the assignment is once you've got a file loaded to be able to do processing on it to convert it from one so-called color space to another. Um, and the, the instructions for those different conversions are all built into the questions themselves. So um, that's, that's the second reason that lab sheet is, is, is quite long because it's actually quite detailed. So there's all sorts of details that are in the, in the PDF and it's really important through the course of the assignment that you read those in, in detail. So some of, the, some of the questions are actually quite long in words, although the solutions to them are just a few lines of code. So um, somewhat of a change in emphasis in the, in the assignment. It's um, dictated by the, the nature of that, of that type of processing, of image processing. I hope you really find the assignment engaging. It's a very visual, it's a very um, visual by its very nature. It's, uh, it provides opportunities for you to, um, 
to, to see the results of your computation and built into the lab and the, the assignment sheet are, are opportunities for you to test whether you're on the right track with the, with the inclusion of some, of some little test cases. And so uh, we've got some um, activities built into both into, into the lab sheet, but also the assignment that allow you to test. Is my answer correct? Well, you'll know it's correct because we'll give you some sample before and after uh, images. That, um, and so the, the formulas that, the, that are built into the, the assignment sheet, some of them look quite complicated, but they're all to be used on a, on a if, you, if you follow them through on a, on a line by line basis, um, they, they map very nicely to the, to the sorts of Python code that we've been, that we've been presenting through the, through the course of the, um, through the course of the um, Event 1003 thus far. Okay, so the, the, the big picture is that the assignment will be due in on the Monday of week 13, the study week, and that you'll be assessed, just like for assignment one, you'll be assessed on your submissions through the course of that, that week. So everyone's got the same submission deadline. It's just when you demonstrate and get graded will depend on, on your um, assessed lab for that, for that week 13 not assessed lab rate, rather for your scheduled lab for week for week 13. Okay, so that's just to kick off the assignment and this week's lab. I can see that Sarah's just completed the conversion of the file. It'll appear on um, on Blackboard shortly um, and probably posted here as well. And that'll allow you to, as I say, I, I can't stress enough for you that this week's uh, lab activity, this week's lab sheet, much more than usual, is a springboard to getting you into the assignment. Okay, lecture content. I wanna cover two things with you this morning. The first of them is an extension and an application of uh, some content or the content that we looked at in last Thursday's lecture on the so-called normal distribution. Um, that's a way of generating random numbers that follow a particular uh, pattern. I'll remind you what that pattern looks like. We'll in fact recap last Thursday's lecture and then we'll use that as a starting point for, 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 the, for the extension that we need. That'll probably take us the first half of today's lecture. Second half of today's lecture is going to be um, the topic of um, fitting a straight line to some data. It's one of the most common activities, data processing activities that an engineer will perform, taking some data and doing some initial processing of it to extract meaning from that data. So fitting a straight line to data is a really key task that engineers need to perform. And, um, and I'll show you how to, how to do that. The emphasis in, in both the in both con chunks of content for today, both the normal distribution and the fitting the straight line to data, the emphasis will be very much on, on giving you the tools that you need in Python to do that processing, giving you the tools in Python to be able to generate random numbers that follow the standard distribution, the normal distribution, and giving you the tools in Python to be able to fit a straight line to data. There won't be much theory, in fact, very little theory at all. There's some fascinating theory behind both topics today. This is not the place or the course to develop it. Um, you'll see that later in your course. What I want to do today is focus very much on giving you the hands-on tools to giving you code that you can model your own code on and to give you some images that you can keep in your mind as to what these two processes are all about, both generating random numbers that are, follow a, um, a, a so-called normal distribution and fitting straight line to data. And in each case, we'll look at um, an application that, that brings those ideas to life and, and shows you the way in which those two tools can be used to solve problems of, of interest. So just to recap, the first half a dozen slides or so today will be a direct recap of content that you've seen um, from last Thursday. So I'm really just bringing you back up to speed where we finished on last Thursday. So the the normal distribution is a, is a way of generating random numbers whose description is most easily captured by something called a probability density function. And it's, it's, it's written there in the, in the boxed equation. 
I'll remind you what the interpretation of a probability density function is in the slides to come. The particular form of that equation, I'm not going to focus on it, but the, the word, the, the phrase that's often informally used to describe the normal distribution is a bell curve. So if you were to plot that function, and which we will do today several times, if you plot it, it looks like a, be a bell curve. It's high at the top, it falls off either side, it's got some symmetry, and then the tails extend out. And this, um, the standard normal distribution, the one that we presented last Thursday, is a special case of the of the more general normal distribution, otherwise known as a Gaussian distribution. Personally, I'm used to calling it a Gaussian, Gaussian distribution. I'm using normal distribution because the, uh, the function that's used in Python to generate those random numbers is called normal. But personally, if I think of these random numbers, I call them Gaussians. And as engineers, we tend to call them Gaussians. And for those of you that go on to use um, random numbers in, in your later courses that follow this, this, this PDF, this probability density function, you'll probably call, you'll almost certainly call them um, Gaussians. Statisticians call them normals. Um, but again, I'm following the terminology that, that is consistent with the, with the use of the, the NumPy library. And in fact, the call to generating these normal random numbers is, is shown right at the bottom of this, of this slide three. And I've used colors to highlight a couple of parameters of really key interest for us today. So if we want to generate, what is it this case, 100,000 um, normally distributed random numbers, we would use a call to the NumPy library normal that fits inside the random module. So x equals np.random normal with three parameters is the way that we generate um, an array of these normally distributed random numbers. Notice the first two parameters that I've highlighted in red and blue font. Most of what I'm gonna present in the first half of today's lecture is to show you what those numbers mean, literally in, in image form, but also to show you how they can be generalized and what the impact of changing those numbers to, to values other than zero and one, other than the zero, the, the, the red and blue fonts, what the impact that has. So just a reminder, this is, this is material we covered in last Thursday's lecture, but it certainly bears repeating. I wanna give you an interpretation of the probability density function, what it means. What does this function mean? The particular form of it, it is there in the boxed equation. I don't want to focus on it. What I, want to, what I want to do is give you an interpretation of what a probability density function is, because that's going to allow us to interpret the impact of these two parameters that are currently zero and one. So if we generated, um, this case, I think it was 100,000 or a million random numbers, um, this, this, the code to generate this plot was presented in the last Thursday's lecture. So if we were to generate all those numbers in a big array and then generate a histogram where we, where we allocate each number to a bin and count up the number, of num the, the, the number of numbers in those bins, we would get a histogram. If we then normalize the histogram, so we interpret it as a function, so the, the area of that blue function is, is one. If that's equal to one, then we've got a normalized histogram where the, where the, the area in each little slice is proportional, is, is literally the number of, or proportional to the number of uh, random numbers that falls in that range. So that's the, that's the interpretation of, a, of the normalized histogram. And the probability density function is really just the, the, the envelope, the curve of that, of that uh, histogram as we take larger and larger and larger numbers of random numbers and we make the bins ever so smaller. So what's really going on here, there's some actually some clever calculus going on here, but if you haven't seen the tools of calculus, um, that won't mean much, but what's actually going on here, there's a limiting process that means it's a really elegant way of capturing the behavior of random numbers. Random numbers don't, uh, don't um, can be described in different ways. This is a really powerful way of describing them where we capture the, the, uh, the, the, the shape of the distribution in the form of a function. 
And the key is that the area underneath that function between two limits A and B is in fact the probability of drawing a random number from that range when F is a PDF, probability density function. So if we've got one of these functions, and in this course, I would give you such a function if you ever needed it, the interpretation is if we integrate the area under, we compute the area under that function between limits A and B, that is the probability of getting a number between the limits of A and B if we were to draw the number out of a hat. Your special hat, be a hat be described by the probability density function F. So that's the interpretation that we need to give to these PDFs, these probability density functions. And you might remember that I finished last week's Thursday lecture with an example. So if we draw random numbers from the so-called standard normal distribution, and here the emphasis is on the word um, standard, it has this particular PDF that we saw earlier, one on square root of two pi e to the minus x squared on two. That's what the PDF, the probability density function for the one of those standard normal distributions is. So that's just a, that's just a fact. If we wanna know what the probability of, if we generate numbers from that distribution, we draw them out of a hat. We use Python to generate them using the normal function. What's the probability that one of those numbers fits within the range, it falls within the range between one and two, for example? Well, this area interpretation of the PDF says that we should integrate, we should compute the area under that curve between the limits of one and two. And that's the red shaded area that you see there on slide seven. That's the interpretation of the PDF. What's the probability of the random number falls between one and two? It's the area under the curve between one and two. And then we made the observation that actually this, integ this integral between any two, any two finite limits of either the minus x squared on two, that's actually impossible to compute in a, in a, in a form that, that's a, a, um, a form that you can write down on paper. Um, that doesn't worry us because with numerical integration, and we developed the tools of numerical integration over the past uh, uh, lecture and a half, um, we can use an approximation method to compute that area. And the one that the method that I've that I've used over and over now uh, with you is the trapezoidal method, where we actually um, write code to break the area into little slices with a flat with a with a with a straight line top, and we can easily compute the area of those, and we add up all the slices. I've given you the code on several occasions now and you'll see it again later today. And so the area of that red, that red shaded area is 0 0.1359. There's no particular significance to that number other than the fact that it's the area of this red shaded area, this red shaded region between the limits of one and two fits under this, under this blue, the blue curve and the blue curve this bell-shaped curve is nothing more than this function evaluated over the over a range of x. Notice how, for example, um, with this standard normal distribution, that the, the, the function has its has its maximum at zero and it tails off, looks like a hat, Mexican hat. It's a PDF, it's symmetric. This particular PDF is symmetric. And by the time we get to about four, the tails are really sort of reached, you know, they're sort of, they don't actually ever get to zero, but they're pretty close for engineering purposes. We could plot over a wider range, wouldn't really achieve much because the function's effectively zero. That's where we got to last Thursday. End of recap. Now we're going to extend the results that we saw for la from last Thursday. So this standard normal distribution is useful, but it's inflexible. It's inflexible because it always has the shape that you see there on page seven. It's always centered at zero. It always tails off so that by the time you get to about four or five, plus or minus four or five, the tail's effectively gone. So the idea of capturing random numbers that are centrally located and then the probability of occurrence 
diminishes as we move away from this, the, 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 the central peak, that's a really powerful one in engineering. It, it occurs everywhere. But the standard PDF, the standard normal PDF is very um, inflexible. And so we introduced two new two parameters to uh, much more flexibly um, use these bell shaped curves. What I could do is give you the equation for the, for the, the more general form of the, the PDF. And I will do that in a few slides. But this course, Eng1003, is not about mathematics. It's about using programming tools in the form of Python. So what I want to do is experimentally show you what the impact of changing those first two parameters is in the call to the normal, normal function before we look at the mathematics. There'll only be one equation. I don't want you to see the equation before you see the the, get an intuitive sense for what these two parameters are. And these two parameters, I'm going to start use them by their proper name. The first one in red is called the mean, and the second one is called the standard deviation. That's a term from statistics. We'll use the, 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 the abbreviation SD. The impact of the first parameter is that it's going to shift the central value or the average value, the mean value of the random numbers the mean value of a standard normal is zero. So we're just as likely to choose a positive number as we are a negative number. The first parameter is the mean, it's gonna be able to allow us to shift the central location where the peak is in the PDF. Standard deviation is gonna be a number that controls the spread of that PDF around its central value. And so those two parameters, I've used color here to highlight them we're going to experimentally observe what the impact of changing those two parameters is. Here's the impact of the mean parameter. So if you look in the title of this image that I show, I show you here, and I'll give you the code for generating this, um, this image on the, on the very next slide. I've also posted it in Discord, in lecture, lecture code um, channel, and I've already also posted it on Blackboard. So you can generate um, the curve, the, the histograms that you see in front of you. So the title of this slide captures what I've done, np.randomnormal, where I've chosen a mean parameter that's either 0, 5, or 15, captured by the red, blue, and black histograms. The second parameter is fixed at 1. So if you think about the second parameter is what this one I called SD, the standard deviation. I've fixed that at 1. And then I've generated the number of random numbers is, is 100,000 in each case. And then so what you see here are three histograms. If I generate random numbers by calling random normal from the NumPy library 100,000 times with mean zero, 100,000 times with mean five, 100,000 times with mean 15. And you can see in each case, the central value of the peak peak of the of the histogram occurs at 0, 5, and 15. So you can see that the impact of changing the first parameter in the call to, to random normal is, is just to shift the location of the peak. That's, that's what it does. Here's the code to do that. Um, you'll see here in, again, I've posted this code, meandemo.py. I've posted it in, in Discord, also in Blackboard, so you can run the code yourself. I encourage you to do that. In lines seven through to nine, you can see that I've got three successive calls to the normal function. First with parameter zero, second with parameter five, and the second with parameter 15, all in the first location. Notice that the standard deviation parameter is the same in each case, it's equal to one. And the reason for that, or how that shows up, is that each of these histograms has the same width. And they're all got the same basic shape. It's the translation that's occurring because of the first parameter. Uh, you'll see in line six, I've set, as it's common now, I set the random number seed to be one. So if you run the code, you'll be able to generate exactly what you see here, not just a, um, a modification of it for slightly different random numbers. And then in lines 11 through 13, 
we plot the histograms. In this case, I've, I've plotted a normalized histogram. That's what density equals true means. I've then specified the color, red, blue, and black. And then I've done something I may not have shown you how to do before, but it's really handy. If you're ever plotting two or more quantities on a single set of axes, you can use a label, in this case, means equal to zero, means equal to five, means equal to 15. And then using the plot legend command in line 17, that puts this little box up in the right-hand corner that, that shows you what the three different um, histograms are. And because I've used color here, it's really obvious what, the, what, what each uh, element of the legend refers to. Here's the impact of the second parameter. We're going to do the same sort of experiment. Now we're going to fix the mean at zero, indicated in the title of the slide here. But now we're going to choose the standard deviation parameter is to be one, two, or four. And again, we're going to generate 100,000 random numbers in each case. And now you'll see that the central peak occurs at zero in each case. It's symmetric, more or less symmetric. There's some randomness to it because we're generating random numbers. This is not the, a, a plot of the PDF, although if we did plot the PDFs, they would be nice bell-shaped curves that overlaid the envelope of those histograms, those normalized histograms. The standard deviation parameter, the SD parameter, controls the width. And so now if we combine those two, those two, the choice of those two parameters, we've got the ability to shift the central value of the random numbers and also the width of the PDF. If there was one random number PDF probability density function that occurred systematically through all branches of engineering, it's this normal PDF, the Gaussian one that you see here. The idea of being able to choose the mean and the standard deviation to generate random numbers that follow these bell curves, it's used virtually everywhere, certainly outside of engineering too in the natural sciences and actually in the social sciences too, in many cases. But uh, it, for engineering, it's a, it's, a, it's a really useful tool to have in your toolkit. And it's, a, it's great that you get to see it, get your hands on it in, in your first semester of study. There's the code again, posted to Discord, posted to Blackboard. I'd, I'd recommend you run it. Here, it's, it's got almost the same format as the mean demo Python script this time all the actions happening in line seven through nine, where we're using the normal function. This time, the first parameter is fixed to be zero. And the second parameter, the standard deviation, is either one or two or four. The smaller the number, the smaller the spread. The bigger the number, the bigger the spread. And then in lines 11 through to 13, we plot a normalized histogram normalized using the density equals true argument, red, blue, black, and we use labels um, to indicate the three colors using the, using the legend um, command down here in line 17. Okay, so that's what we've been able to do. We've, let me back up just a few slides and summarize. Little mini summary, call to random normal. First parameters, the, the central value of the PDF. The second value is the spread called the mean and standard deviation. If you ever needed the, the, the general form of the probability density function for a Gaussian or a normal, it, here it is at the top of slide 13. It's got, the, it's got similarities with the standard normal that we introduced last Thursday but it's more complicated because we've got these two new parameters and it's completely standard in, in the uh, engineering literature to use the, the Greek letter mu to refer to the mean and the Greek letter sigma to refer to the standard deviation. So the two parameters that we used in Python, the mean and the standard deviation are represented in um, mathematical form in the boxed equation. So let me allay any fears that you might have. That looks like a pretty scary equation if you've never seen um, the normal PDF before, or if you haven't had much to do with statistics before. Let me be clear, 
ENG1003 is not about mathematics as such. It's about using tools that give you the ability to deal with mathematical expressions in solving engineering problems. So there are, there are really two things, potentially three things, but I've listed the two main ones here. It's important for me to be clear about what I expect you to be able to do with these randomly distributed random numbers in this course. I expect you to be able to use a call to the NumPy library um, function normal to generate random numbers for specified um, mu and sigma, for specified mean and standard deviation. In fact, there's the code for doing it on pages 12 and 10. So I'm calling random normal. Here it is in line seven, for example, on, on page 12. That's what I mean about um, what do I expect you to be able to do? I expect you to be able to generate random numbers using that, following that PDF for specified mu and sigma, for specified mean and standard deviation. Second thing I expect you to be able to do is to be able to compute the probability that a, a normally distributed random number, a Gaussian random number, falls in a particular range using numerical integration. And I've created an example on the next slide, next couple of slides, which show you how to do that. In fact, there's a third task I'd expect to be able to do, and I've actually integrated in, that into the code that you see on the, following, on the following page, which is if it was helpful, if it was necessary, you could actually plot this, um, the form of this function. What it would look like would be a bell curve that would fit over one of these histograms if you needed to do that. I've built it into the, this example. Um, I don't really want to go over this point here on, on slide 14 because I've already said it for you. If you take this mathematical expression and you substitute in mu is equal to zero and sigma is equal to one, you get the standard normal distribution that we've seen last week. More importantly, the key point is that the standard normal that we saw last Thursday is a special case of this, of this normal PDF corresponding to means equal to zero and sigma is equal to one, the red and blue numbers here. So what we really have done is take the very specific form of the, the normal PDF that we saw last Thursday, we called it the standard normal, and we've generalized it. And it's this more generalized form, this form that, that occurs um, uh, throughout engineering. It occurs in, 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 in many ways, but um, it's probably only in your future engineering studies that you'll come to see exactly how that's used in your engineering discipline. Let me give you an example. Um, when, when components are fabricated, they are normally fabricated to some nominal value, the value that says what they should be under ideal circumstances. But because of uncertainties in manufacturing, they often uh, have uh, take values that occur over a range of values. And we, we looked at an example much earlier in the in the course, I think it was in week four, where I talked about we made a mechanical, I think it was a bolt or a thread that had a sort of a nominal width. And then there was variation about that because of the manufacturing tolerance. Here's an example. It happens to be an electrical component, but you don't need to know any electrical engineering. Um, there are little electrical components called resistors. Their units is um, uh, the units of ohms, Greek letter uppercase sigma. Um, resistors are made in their millions, billions, and um, probably um, hundreds of billions uh, each year, probably more than that. Um, and they're, they're, they're valued at a fraction of a cent. And for that reason, they, they come with a certain tolerance and uh, resistors have uh, uh, are just are supplied with with a particular tolerance. In in some cases, it's a five percent tolerance. So you might buy one. It might be uh, nominally. It might say on the label that it's a one thousand ohm resistor. In practice, it's going to have a value that falls within the range. If it's a five percent um, tolerance, it's going to be in the range nine fifty to ten nine fifty to ten fifty, meaning that the 5% tolerance is the nominal value of a thousand plus or minus 
five percent of a thousand is fifty. So that the a five percent tolerance on a on a one thousand ohm resistor would would mean its resistance value falls within the range nine fifty to ten fifty. What I've given you here is an observation that suppose we have resistor values that if we um, were to observe many of them, thousands of them, millions of them, then they, that they were their resistance value, if we were to measure every single one individually, it would have a resistance that followed an, a normal distribution with a mean value of a thousand and a standard deviation of 30. So I'm just giving you that as a fact. What I'm asking you to do in this, in this example is to write a Python script which plots the PDF of the resistance values. So what I'm asking you to do is plot a PDF with mu is equal to 1000 and sigma is equal to 30, substitute it into the expression that you see there on line 13 and produce the, the PDF that follows. And then here's where the action gets interesting is I want to use a numerical integration to show that about 90% of the resistor values fall within that, within that range. So I'm going to show you the results of the script, and then I'm going to work through the script. Um, the script in order for you to be able to generate this curve, again, is being placed in, in Discord, also Blackboard. I want to give you a sense of what the question's telling you, what, a sense of what the question's asking and then we'll look at the code that generates it. So the blue curve is the PDF. So even if, let's ignore the, the context. Don't worry about resistance. Don't worry about ohms. You've been told that the mean value mu is equal to 1000. You've been told that the standard deviation sigma is equal to 30. If you pl plug those two numbers, 1030 into this expression, for F that you see on page 13, you'll get the blue curve. Notice how the central value occurs right at the value of, the, of a thousand. It's right at the, at the at, and that's because the peak of a normal PDF occurs at the mean value, the mu value. And the spread of values has been chosen, it's been told you've been, told, you've been um, given the fact that it's equal to 30. There's no particular significance to 30. I've reverse engineered a value that gives nice values for this example. But you see, however, that the spread of numbers is that most of the random numbers are generated somewhere in the range 900 to 1100. The resistor values fall somewhere in that range. And the, the red shaded area has an area of 0.9. In fact, how do I know that? Because I wrote Python code that you're gonna see on the next slide in order to, that's gonna use the trapezoidal method to compute that number. And so the question asks you to, to verify that about 90% of the resistor values fall in the range 950 to 1050, translated into the language of, of Python and um, random numbers, I'm asking you to compute the area under the PDF between 950 and 1050 and show that that area is equal to 0.9. Why 0.9? Because 100% of the numbers fall underneath the PDF. So they've, they occur for some value and 90% of them for these particular parameter values of, um, of the standard deviation being 30 and the mean being 1000. 90% of them fall in the, in, the, in the pink shaded area. How do we do that? Here's the, um, here's the code that does it. Falls over two pages because it's, um, it's a slightly complicated problem. Here we've got our function f being defined in lines four through seven. This as I highlight here, is the, the highlighted expression that you see is the, is the equation for the, the general form of the normal PDF. One on square root of two pi, um, one on sigma, one on sigma times square root of two pi times e to the minus x minus mu all squared onto 
on sigma squared. Complicated expression, it looks like that when you typeset it in mathematics. So if I asked you to plot the PDF, if you're like me, it'd probably take you a couple of a couple of goes in, in Python to get it to get it right. It's a reasonably complicated expression. But that's what it looks like when defined as a function value. Inside the function I've defined what mu and sigma are, there are more complicated ways of um, or more sophisticated ways of writing this function that would pass in the mu and sigma as arguments, for example. I don't want to use them here. So I've just put the mu and sigma, the mean and the standard deviation, I've built them into the function definition. So lines four to seven look a bit more complicated than we've seen before, but they are effectively um, uh, a function which returns the value of the function f if we pass it in some x. Lines nine to, to 15 need no great commentary from me because we've seen them about half a dozen times before. It's the trapezoidal method for integrating a function between the limits of a and b using a total of n panels. You've seen it before. We've also got here in the second half of the code, the limits of integration being 950 and 1050. We then integrate that function, the, uh, the, the, standard, the normal function between the limits of A and B. And then we express the results. We display the results on the console. I'll run it for you live in a moment. And then in the rest of the code, we plot the function in line six and nine. And then in line seven and 10, we plot the pink area under the shaded, the shaded region. So the first answer to the first question is plot the PDF for the resistance values. That occurs in um, line six, where we define the range of resistance values everywhere between 900 and 1100. Line nine, we plot the PDF. Sorry, in line 10, rather, we plot the PDF. In lines seven and nine, we plot the pink shaded region. So let's do that live now. Giving you the code is... Here's the code, function definition, trapezoidal method for integrating, called trapezoidal to, to compute the area under the curve between 950 and 1050, and then some plotting commands. So let's run that live. And we see on the console, it, it tells us that the probability of the resistance falling in the range 950 to 1050 is 90.44%. Let's call that 90%, um, approximately 90%. And here we've got the curve, the PDF plotted in blue. The pink region shows the area under the function between 950 and 1050. And if we, for example, were to change the limits Let's, I'm going to change these limits of integration between, say, 925 and 1075. What, what, what's the, pro the, the probability for the resistance falling in the range 925 or um, to, to, actually, let's make it 900 to 1100. Let's make it nice and easy. If we bump those numbers down to 900, bump that one up to 1100 and run the code again, We'll now see that the pink shaded area is, has been extended, the range has been extended, and that the probability of resistance falling in the range between 900 and 1100 is 99.9%. .9%. So almost all the resistors with these two parameters of mean being 1000 and standard deviation being 30, almost all of them would, would, would occur um, between the limits of 900 and 1100. So almost all of them, resistance manufactured to that tolerance would be within plus or minus 10% of the nominal value of a thousand, for example. Good. Let me just return those to there. Okay. Okay, so 
we've now got the ability to generate random numbers between uh, the, that are more flexible than the standard normal. And that we've got these two parameters, the standard, the mean and the standard deviation, which allows us to control the spread. If I were to ask you how to use these random numbers in some sort of assessment item, it's not about mathematics, it's about using Python to be able to generate those random numbers and then being able to use a numerical integration tool like the trapezoidal method to, um, to compute numbers. So I guess it is, it is using mathematics, but it's not, it's not sophisticated mathematics um, dealing with that function. It's, it's being able to specify that function as a Python function and then use numerical integration to compute the area if you needed it. Okay, that's the first part of today's lecture. Second half, we're going to revisit a topic that we looked at in week six. And again, I'm giving you tools that engineers um, use in their, in their studies and also engineers use in their daily practice which is um, to try and make sense of data. And often we get given data in a series of data points and we need to make sense of that data or use that data in a, in a way that solves a problem. And one of the common problems that we need to solve in, um, in engineering is coming up with a, a uh, a summarized form of, of the data that's been presented to us. Another problem we need to do is sometimes uh, fill in the gaps between existing data. And so there's a range of techniques in engineering that come under the umbrella of curve fitting, where we try and create a function that best fits a series of data points. And there are two different variations on, on curve fitting. One of which you've already seen in week six, and that form made up a key component of the first programming assignment, and that's in the form of interpolation. Today's um, curve fitting activity that I want to present to you is something that gets used in conjunction with, with interpolation, but is quite distinct from it. And I want to demonstrate the, the similarity, but also the difference between interpolation and curve fitting or line, straight line fitting. The more general term that gets used is regression. That's a term that's inherited from statistics. I tend to think of it as straight line fitting or function fitting or curve fitting. I'm gonna present or represent just for a couple of slides, some material that we saw back in week six. Suppose we were given 11 pairs of data points and we wanted to make sense of that data. We wanted to summarize it, or maybe we, the problem was to identify uh, the, the value of the function at, at points other than the, the points at which the data was given to us. So the, the data that's given to us in this problem is 11 pairs of data points. And they consist of like ordered pairs, one value of T, one value of YT. So this was, using, this is a slide that you've exactly seen in week six. I've reposted the code in, in Discord and Blackboard should you wish to rerun it, but it is material that you've seen before. We choose these, these dots and there's nothing significant about the particular values they, they take other than they follow a, an increasing trend. So one thing we could do with that data is to connect the dots. And this is a process known as interpolation. You've seen interpolation back in week six and you applied interpolation in the first assignment. So interpolation says the data points are correct. What we'd like to do is understand the value of the function at time points between the, the points at which we've made observations. And the classic example of this in, in application of interpolation was in the assignment where there were measurements of position that were available at certain time points. And because the, the GPS signal was lost, the data was missing for some time points. And that we asked you to 
use interpolation to effectively join the dots between for, and, and fill in the fill in the gaps between um, time points that we're missing. So that's interpolation. I'm not going to say any more about it today because what I want you to do is focus on a very different way of solving that problem. It's effective, it's, it's fitting a straight line to data. And you will sometimes hear it called as regression, sometimes hear it form uh, linear regression, sometimes uh, a line of best fit. It's got a range of names, but the visual image I want you to capture is that we're given some data points and that we want to fit a straight line through them. Now, there's a number of ways in which we could fit a straight line. The one we're interested in fitting is the is inverted commas the best method or the best the best fit. Um, in order to talk about best fit, we'd need to use um, mathematical tools that are just slightly beyond what I'm going to present in this course. And you, if you go on to study this content in later courses, you'll probably hear it called least squares. And so least squares fitting, least squares regression, it's used in many branches of engineering, but the mathematics for, for actually computing the, the, the gradient and the, 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 the vertical uh, axis intercept in order to define a straight line, um, they're slightly beyond what I want to cover in this course. However, Python's going to give us tools to be able to fit a straight line through some data points. And that's what I want to focus on for you today, giving you the tools that if someone was to give you a collection of data, you could very easily use Python to fit a line which best captured the, which best summarized the data that was given to you. And so you'll see that that straight line, that blue straight line, in fact, it goes through, well, it looks like it goes through about maybe two of the points. All the other points are sort of scattered either side of the line. The line of best fit is one that minimizes the discrepancies between the red dots and the straight line. And again, the details there are beyond the scope of this course, but they would talk about least squares optimization for example, as a way of defining what the line of best fit is. We don't need to know about least squares optimization because it's built in for us inside a Python library. And so interpolation involves joining the dots. Regression means fitting a straight line. And fitting a straight line is a really useful way of summarizing a data set that's given to us. Um, when the underlying physics or the underlying um, mechanism for generating that data is either too complicated to understand or too time consuming to understand or doesn't exist. Um, and I'll give you an, a, a nice example towards the, the tail end of today's lecture, which is an application of fitting a straight line to some real data. But they both sort of solve similar problems. They're both making sense of data set. So line fitting in Python, what I'm gonna do is I'll present this in a way that uh, focuses on giving you the, the tools that you need to solve an engineering problem. And then I'll use those tools to solve a demonstration problem. And then I'll use those tools to solve an actual problem. So the problem in line fitting is that our input data consists of XY data pairs. In the previous slides, I've talked about time and a function value at that time, I'm gonna switch the terminology here uh, to X and Y rather than T and Y. And the reason I do that is because the particular function that we're going to use in, in a, a Python library is called curve fit. And curve fit usually talks about X and Y rather than T and Y, but it's a change in symbols, but it's not a change in, in concept. So the goal is to calculate a, a line of best fit which best fits the data. And we're going to do, we, we know that, we know from high school mathematics that a, a straight line can be described by a gradient and, and an intercept. So in an equation form, we've got this equation here, y equals mx plus b. You would have seen this at high school where we've got the gradient m 
and the the y off the the, well, the y intercept b, which is the the point at which the the line intersects the uh, the vertical axis or the axis where or the point at which the x point is equal to zero. Now, there's a number of tools available to us in different Python libraries. The one that I've chosen is one called CurveFit. It does what we need to do. It's also more flexible and it can be extended to the other forms of best fit should we ever need them. And it occurs, it, it, the, the CurveFit function is inside this, um, I'll call it Skippy. Some people call it SciPy. I'll call it Skippy um, library and the optimized module inside it. Uh, if you haven't previously used Skippy, and I don't know whether it's come up earlier in the course, if you haven't used that uh, library before, you may need to do a pip install Skippy at in the terminal. Um, uh, just the first the first time you do it, and then and then it's there for you thereafter. So th that's how you in, uh, th th that gives us access to this this curve fit function. How do we use the curve fit function? Well, in order to, to use curve fit, we need to uh, define a function. And I'll show you how, how to do that in the example shortly, which is really the equation of a straight line. And then we pass in two arrays, X and Y, and these contain the data sets. These are the X and the Y components of the, the, the data uh, pairs the, the, that we are using to fit. These are the the X and Y coordinates of the red dots, if you like. Now, curve fit returns to us two, two quantities, P opt and P cov. Ignore P cov. Don't want to talk about what that does. Um, we don't need it for this course. But, but we need to include it in the function call here because uh, curve fit's going to return two quantities for us. So we need to, we need to, uh, make sure that the, the, the call to curve fit uses the peak of um, quantity, but we're not going to use it. So let's just ignore it. We're going to call it, but then, and then subsequently ignore it. What we do want though, is that P opt is going to be an array. So the call to curve fit is going to return to us an array. And the zeroth element of the array is going to be the gradient of the line of best fit. And the, the first element or the one element is going to be the offset. So this is a this is does exactly what we want. We pass in to curve fit two arrays, the coordinates of the red dots, the x and y coordinates as two single dimensional arrays. And what we get back is the gradient and the intercept of the line of best fit. It's really nice. So here's an example. And this is code again. Um, in line fit demo, we're going to run this live in just a moment. This is code that I've that you've got access to in Discord and Blackboard. And so oh, I've changed line colors here. I've just realized uh, before we use red dots and blue lines. Now we're going to use blue dots and red lines. So what I've got here is I think it's 100 data points that we've got X along the horizontal axis, Y along the vertical axis, and the blue dots we generate randomly. And then the red line of best fit is created by a call to the curve fit function using this syntax here on page 24. So let's do that now and then look at the code live. Line fit demo. Here it is. Um, we define a straight line function, mx plus b. Then what we wanna do is generate our x, y pairs. So let's do that first. What we'll do is, that, that's all, we'll, we'll leave it like that. We'll leave it as is. So in lines six and seven, we define a straight line. I'll show you how that function's used in a moment. It's in the it's in this line it's in line fourteen of the code the code here. In lines nine through twelve, we generate a hundred pairs of points that we're going to show as blue dots, and we do that 
by generating um, 100 points randomly between 0 and 100, 0 and 99. So it was rather we, our x coordinate is fixed, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up, up to 99. And then we generate our y coordinate as being 3 times x plus 2 to, plus 2. So this is really the, the straight line 3x plus 2. And then we add onto it some noise. And for good measure, let's add on some, some normal noise where we've got a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 10. So line 11. Is is, a, is an application of a of a call to the um, the normal function that we saw in the first half of today's lecture. Then in line twelve, we plot the data as blue dots. So the first half of this code generates the data. The most important line in this code is line fourteen. It's where we pass in the data and a description of the model we wanna to fit to that data, in this case, a straight line. And the line fitting is done by the call to curve, the curve fit function. So it computes the gradient and offset of the line of best fit to the data. And then our job in lines 15 and 16 is to take the, the array that was returned in Popt and extract the zeroth and oneth elements as the gradient and offset. And then we can plot the red straight line, um, which is the line of the line of best fit after we display the values to the console here. So let's run that live now. Line fit demo. And there we have the 100 pairs of data points represented as the blue dots, and then the line of best fit that, that connects them there as the, as the red line. What I also do is display the results of the, the, uh, the gradient and the offset of the line of best fit are uh, displayed to the console. So they're down here in, um, M equals 3.03 .03 and B equals 0.95. That is the, the gradient and the offset of the line of best fit to the data. Notice that the, the straight line fit has done a pretty good job of estimating what the real gradient, the underlying gradient was here of, of three. Hasn't done such a great job of getting the intercept right. However, it doesn't really matter because the, the, the y-intercept, whether, whether it's zero or one or two, really doesn't matter too much um, given the scale of the, the vertical axis here. So it's actually done a very good job of, of choosing this, this, this red line here. If I then go to the code and just, just for, the, for a moment, just comment out the, the fixing of the random number seed and run the code again, You'll see this time it's absolutely nailed the gradient. We've got a different collection of 100 data points and the straight line fit in this case is to two decimal places has absolutely nailed the, the gradient. It's got the offset a bit wrong, but again, um, uh, being wrong by a, a, couple of, a couple of units when the vertical scale is such as it is really doesn't matter. Um, it is the best line fit. Run it again. There we get the gradient almost exactly right again. Run it again. This time it's underestimated the gradient, but it's still done a pretty good job. So that's that's a really powerful um, uh, tool for you to be able to, to take random data and fit a straight line to it. Um, I've probably commented on, there's the code, line fit demos in Discord, but also in Blackboard. You can run it yourself, urge you to do that. Experiment with the, with the parameter settings, change, this, change the gradient and offset of the, the underlying line and see how well the, the straight line fit 
does change the variance of the noise, for example, the standard deviation of the noise here, change that, see what the impact is on the, on, on the code. There's the commentary I've said, I've said all that, there's a reference, there's an example for you. I'm gonna to finish today's lecture with an application to some real, to some real data. So this is uh, data that I've obtained from a, um, a NASA climate monitoring site. So let me give you a bit of the background. Uh, on a daily basis, satellites passing over the, um, the North Pole, the Arctic region, they uh, measure data that allow scientists to estimate the extent of sea ice. And uh, that sea ice over the course of a season um, grows and shrinks. It, the sea ice extent is maximum in, um, in, in winter and is minimum in, in summer or just after the peak of summer. And the, in September is the, is the minimum is the it's the minimum because it's the it's just after the northern the northern summer and so if you measure in, in millions of square kilometers on a daily basis what the sea ice looks like you get you get a number each day then if you average those numbers over a month you get the sea ice extent in a given calendar month what you see here is uh, NASA data, which uh, captures the sea ice extent in the month of September, the average sea ice extent in the month of September, uh, since the year 1979, when these satellite missions commenced. And the data extends up until the year 2020. Now, if visually, you can see a bit of a downward trend there. If you go back to 1979, there was almost 8 million square kilometres of ice in September. In the year 2020, it was down to uh, a little less than 4 million square kilometres. And so due to the effects of global warming, the Arctic sea ice extent is, is, um, is uh, falling um, at a rate of about 13% per decade. Now that's a, just, that's a graphical image, but if you follow this link here at the bottom of page 28, you can actually get the data. So you can actually get a data set which describes the sea ice extent in September, um, every, every September since 1979 up to the year 2020. And we are going to solve the following problem. We are going to take that data, we're going to use a straight line fit to the data and estimate when the Arctic will be free of sea ice um, in the month of September. So we wanna know when the line of best fit, if you sort of go back up to here, if you're sort of visually fit with your eye, you can see it's taken about, what did I say, 1979 to 2020, that's about 40 years. It's taken about 40 years for the sea ice extent to drop from about 8 million square kilometres down to about four. We're going to fit a straight line to that data and then continue the straight line out until it reaches zero. And we're going to estimate what year that's going to be. It's going to be about 40 years down the track because based on the assumption that that data is linear. Now, no, notice that, and I've chosen this example because I find that it's interesting. It's also real data, um, but it also means that sometimes when we're fitting straight lines to data, we're not proposing a mechanism. We're not trying to explain the data. We're using the data to model and uh, and forecast. Um, there's no, we're not trying to model the impact of um, global warming or the impact of greenhouse gases or uh, or the effect of storms on the on the way that the sea ice evolves over the course of a season. We're just going to take the data and do a straight line fit to it. And so there are two key steps in the solution. We're going to use the, the Skippy um, curve fit function. Uh, and we're going to use it to generate a, a straight line fit. And then we're going to use that in the second stage of the of the, the, the problem, we're going to take that straight line fit and extend it out to the point at which the y-axis, the, the sea ice extent axis, is um, is zero. And the, the line y equals mx plus b intersects the x-axis, namely when y is equal to zero. If we rearrange that for x, if we can if we can estimate 
what the gradient and intercept of the best straight line is, we can estimate the X, which is the year, and we're going to estimate the year in which the sea ice extent will be zero. So here's the code. I'll run it for you live in a moment. Um, we're importing the curve fit function from the Skippy library. And here in lines six and seven, we define a straight line. Just a little, a little aside, the curve fit function is really powerful. If we defined this function here as being a quadratic, for example, or a cubic, or some other function, nonlinear function, the curve fit code will actually work and will actually find the coefficients of the best fitting parabola, the best fitting cubic, and so on. But straight line's good enough for us today. Here's the data set. I've actually done a little bit of work and put it in the form of uh, an array for you um, in lines 12 through to 16. But the actual data itself is freely available and I've put the link in here in a comment. This is a, a practice I always, I often follow when I'm writing my own code for research, for example. If I obtain a data set from somewhere, I put in a comment where I got the data from. Come back to it six months, 12 months, five years later, I know where I got the data from. And in line 11, I'm using the A range function, which has come up through the, through the course of this uh, N1003 um, in some of the, the lab activities. Um, the call to A range here generates, um, in this case, evenly spaced numbers between 1979 and 2020. So here we've got our straight line fit, or we're preparing to do a straight line fit. And here we've got our data set. Second half of the code, again, it's code that fits over, it's, uh, extends over two, over two pages. Here is in line one on, on page 31, you see the call to curve fit. We're passing in a description of the, the function we'd like to fit to the data. In this case, it's a straight line. And then we pass in the X and Y coordinates. In this case, it's the year, is the horizontal axis, and the sea ice extent, which is the vertical axis, previously called them X and Y. And then in lines two and three, after curve fits done its magic, it's used a least squares algorithm to compute the, the coefficient to best fit. Don't worry about least squares, but do worry about the best fit. We get the gradient and the offset. So all the magic's done in, um, in line one. And then what we want to do, remember the problem was to take that straight line data and then extend it out until it intercepted the the, the, the x-axis at a point where the y, the vertical axis, the sea ice extent, the forecast sea ice extent was zero. And so what I'm really doing here, in fact, uh, uh, depending on how I'd ask the question, uh, an answer to this question would be, would a, a good enough answer would probably be to uh, draw the straight line and then just zoom in on the plot to get an estimate of the year. I've done a little bit of the work here um, in order to produce a nicer looking graph. So line five is the annual, the, the year we'd like to uh, plot the forecast sea ice. And I've chosen an endpoint of the year 2079, one year before the, this, this second um, argument to this A range function. So we're gonna actually plot out the, um, the forecast sea ice from a, a hundred years out from um, when, it, when the first satellite mission flew in 1979. And here's, if you look at this inside the, the, the format statement, we've got the number minus B on M. Minus B on M is the intercept of that straight line with the vertical axis. So if you run that code, let's do it live. You want to take a guess what year the sea ice is forecast to be zero in September. Let's run the code. If we run the code, the blue dots are the measured data. The red straight line is the line of best fit. That's been extended out until such time as the um, that line intercepts the, the horizontal axis when the sea ice extent is zero. 
and then the number minus B on M, where B is the offset, M is the gradient that the line are best fit, that gives us an estimate of what of um, when the September sea ice extent is going to be zero. In this case, it's in the year 2071. So um, I probably won't be alive. Many of you probably will be, and you'll wake up one September and there'll be no sea ice over the Arctic. So the, the point that I'm making here with this data set is the one I made earlier, and I want to repeat it. We're not coming up with a mechanism. We're using a data set that's been given to us. If you eyeball those blue dots, there's seasonal variation, but there's a downwards trend. We're using the line of best fit in order to create a forecast um, into, into the future, which then allows us to um, estimate the point at which the, the, the blue dots, were they to continue on their present trend, would, would, would intercept the, the horizontal axis. So there's a little bit of nicey graphics here, the, the green square and the, the calculation of the intercept. I regard that as icing on the cake. What I do want you to be able to do though, based on today's lecture, is to be given a collection of blue dots, use a, use a call to the function curve fit to generate a line of best fit and then plot that line, uh, overlay that line on the, on the actual um, the data set that was given to you. And we're just about done because what follows in the lecture notes is really just a copy of the, 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 the run that we saw then. So lecture summary. Um, we covered two different topics today. We, we extended the normal distribution to be able to generate normal or Gaussian random numbers with a specified mean and standard deviation or a specified central point and spread. And then I showed you how to use a call to a Skippy library in order to fit a straight line to some data and I gave, gave you a couple of applications to that. So we're done with the lecture. Just want to recap though, that the assignment three, assignment two rather, was uh, made available on Blackboard earlier this morning. This week's lab sheet is the one that I encourage you to uh, get your head around by attending the face-to-face -face and Zoom labs this week because it's the lab sheet this week that will really bootstrap you into, into the uh, early stages of the assignment. So I'm sure there's lots of discussion going on on Discord now. I'll, um, I'll, I'll finish the lecture at this point um, and I'll um, see you Thursday. Until then, 